Thank you everyone for coming. For anyone who doesn't know me, I'm a graduate student in the neuroscience program in Dr. Kevin Park's lab, where we use the eye as a model to study CNS injury and disease. Today, I'll be going over my main thesis project, which involves AAV retromediated gene modulation and real-time imaging to examine retinal ganglion cell survival. In the eye, retinal ganglion cells are the sole output neurons that transmit visual information to the brain through the optic nerve. They're a heterogeneous population of cells that have, over the years, been shown to have different physiological, morphological, and molecular characteristics. Dating back to 1892, Santiago Ramon y Cajal, one of the most important neuroscientists of the uh, last century, was already focused on the different renal ganglion cell subtypes. And today, with the advent of high throughput sequencing technologies, we know that there are more than 40 types of mouse, um, 40 types of retinal ganglion cells in the mouse retina. These are examples of some different RGC types. RGCs are responsible for different functions in the retina. Some, for example, are involved in pupil dilation. Others are involved in regulating our circadian rhythm. And an interesting, interesting observation uh, of these different renal ganglion cell types is that they differ strongly in their ability to survive insults. As we can see in the schematic, some retinal ganglion cell types are more resistant while some are more susceptible to insults. So this tells us that renal ganglion cells have a selective resilience to injury. This intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cell is a well-known resilient type while these on-off direction selective renal ganglion cell types are known to be highly susceptible. Oh, sorry. Are known to be um, highly susceptible to injury. And I'm focusing on these two RDC types because they're the focus for the background study that I will be talking about. Okay. In this study, um, Eric Bray, a former graduate student in the lab, sought to explore the molecular profile of IPRGCs. This is a flat mount retina from a transgenic mouse line that specifically labels IPRGCs, as we can see here in magenta. In this zoomed in image of the retina, he observed that six weeks after exotomy, while so many renal ganglion cells have died, the majority of surviving RGCs um, are these magenta-labeled IPRGCs, a finding that is uh, also consistent with previous work. This is a cross-section of the injured optic nerve, and Eric also observed that there is robust regeneration of uh, TDT-expressing IPRGC axons. So not only are IPRGCs resilient to death, but they can also regenerate. Now let's look at uh, susceptible on-off direction selective renal ganglion cell types. Since the vast majority of these vulnerable RGCs are shown to die after injury, Eric generated a transgenic mouse line that also knocks down the pro-apoptotic gene backs to see if these susceptible RGCs could regenerate in the absence of cell death. And two weeks following optic nerve crush, we see that there are no observable CTB positive, GTB positive, GFP positive axons. So from this, he concluded that uh, these on-off direction selective renal ganglion cells are incapable of regenerating axons even in the absence of cell death. So here, transgenic animals with fluorescently labeled IPRGCs or fluorescently labeled on off direction selective retinal ganglion cells underwent optic nerve crush injury or sham surgery. Three days later, retinas were dissociated and plated. Then, using a pipette, the TDT labeled IPRGCs or the GFP labeled um, susceptible retinal ganglion cells were collected manually one by one. RNA from these cells were then purified and sequenced. 
Um, and we can see here um, that RNA sequencing of the HP9, which labels the um, on-off direction selective renal ganglion cells, and OPN4, which labels IPRGC, shows very nice clustering of samples based on cell type and treatment. In this Venn diagram, we can see that there are many genes differentially expressed in either of these two subtypes after injury. So I analyzed the transcriptomic data generated in the previous study and identified some genes to be very highly differentially expressed in the injured susceptible renoganglion cell type, including SRTF1, ZCCHC12, CLIK1, and CLIK4. SRTF1 was found to be differentially expressed in the susceptible um, renoganglion cell type after injury relative to the regenerative IPRGCs. ZZCHC12 was found to be upregulated after injury in both the IPRGC and the susceptible renoganglion cell type, but most importantly, it was found to be highly upregulated in the injured relative to the uninjured susceptible renoganglion cell type. Um, and we additionally found chloride intercellular channel 1 and 4 to be highly induced after injury, as we can see. CLIK1 is upregulated in both IPRGCs and in the susceptible renoganglion cell type after injury. And CLIK4 was found to be differentially expressed after injury in the susceptible type relative to the uninjured susceptible RGC type and the regenerative um, resilient renoganglion cell type. So based on this analysis, we wondered if we were able to silence these genes, um, could they have an effect on retinal ganglion cell survival? I've currently performed knockdowns of SRTF1 and ZCCHC12, which are transcriptions factors whose roles in cell survival and regeneration remain unknown. So, my hypothesis for this project is that uh, the upregulated candidate genes regulate injury responses and may play a role in retinal ganglion cell survival following axonal injury. My objective is to examine the effects of AAV retromediated gene silencing of target genes on retinal ganglion cell survival after injury. So first let's look at what is the expression profile of SRTF1, Z and ZCCHC12 and RGCs after injury. So most recently, Joshua Sain's group performed high-throughput single-cell RNA sequencing on RGCs and generated an atlas of adult mouse RGC types, about 46 in total. They then used this data as a groundwork to track type-specific responses to injury. Following this, they manipulated genes selectively expressed in resilient or vulnerable types, um, finding some that promote RGC survival and axon regeneration following optic nerve crush. Looking at the RNA sequencing data they generated, uh, we see in this cluster map of RGC subtypes that before injury, there is virtually no expression of SRTF1. But four days after injury, we see that um, there is increased expression of um, the SRTF1 in several of the renal ganglion cell types. And this remains until about, uh, even at 14 days after injury. Uh, this is similar results we see with ZZCHC12. There's minimal expression of this gene before the injury, yet after four days uh, of the optic nerve crush, we can see an uh, increased destruction of ZCCHC12 at four, four days and uh, 14 days after uh, injury. So for my project, in order to promote silencing for these genes, we had to validate the AAV SHRNAs against these target genes. To do this, we combined potential target sequences for the shRNA into a synthetic construct that was inserted in a plasmid along with the reporter um, renal luciferase. 
The plasmid was then co-transfected into the cells together with each of the individual SHRNAs. So after that, if the SHA are not, is not specific, so it does not um, knock down the target gene, we, we would see high expression of this luciferase. On the other hand, if the SHRNA is specific and it um, correctly knocks down, it, it's uh, efficient in knocking down our target gene, then we should see a reduced expression of luciferase in the cells. As we can see here, um, different SHRNAs were tested as potential targets of SRTF1 and DCCHC12. All demonstrated good knockdown capabilities, and we selected these specific SHRNAs, which are highlighted in red, based on this assay and uh, on our Western blot results. So this is a, our main question that we want to ask. Does knockdown of target genes affect retinal ganglion cell survival? So to do this, we first considered um, our approach. So typically, AAV SHRNAs are injected in the vitreous of the eye. However, this method can bring potential issues, including ocular inflammation and transduction variability. So we thought, why don't we try to retrogradely transduce RGCs by injecting the SHRNAs into the brain instead? And in this way, so if we inject our a virus into the brain, um, then that will travel down the retinal ganglion cell axons and be able to label uh, our retinal ganglion cells in the retina in the retinal fundus. And just to clarify uh, a point um, that is advantageous of using AAV2 retro over the intravitreal AAV2 injection. Uh, one, it allows us to visualize transduce GFP positive renal ganglion cells in real time and precisely track their survival over time using uh, in vivo confocal imaging. This is something that has been proven challenging with um, intravitreal AAV injection due to ocular pathology that occurs. We can also avoid development of ocular inflammation that is associated with intravitreal injection since inflammation itself can induce regenerative and reparative signals so this would create variability in our results. Another advantage is that we can circumvent issues from transduction variability among animals, which is a common feature with intravitreal viral injections. Lastly, we can ensure that we are only infecting RGCs in the retina, which is something, again, that's not possible uh, to guarantee with intravitreal AAV2 injections. So for this study, I'm using AAV retro SHRNA GFP. This AAV retro CASPID um, allows for robust internalization by axons it, and mediates retrograde access to long projection neurons with high efficiency. So this is what I'm using to um, inject into the mouse brain. Two to three weeks after our injection, uh, I perform optic nerve crush. Um, and just before that, I do perform some baseline images. I take um, in vivo images of the retinal fundus and do baseline counts before the injury. Then at two, four, and eight weeks, I do follow-up images. Um, I also perform counts as well to see our uh, progression of um, retinal ganglion cell um, pathology. And also after uh, our eight-week time point, I also section the retinas and uh, perform immunohistochemistry using RBPMS, uh, an antibody that's specific for RGCs, uh, GFP, and, and other molecules of interest. So quickly, this is how I can visualize the cells in real time. I use a confocal scanning laser ophthalmoscope to detect the expression of GFP-labeled retinal ganglion cells that were transduced by the virus. So what we do here is we anesthetize the animal, dilate the eyes, and slowly focus on the retinal fundus. I have a, a video, I don't, I hope it works.
I guess not. Uh, so, but so basically, we we can see that's all right. Uh, this is what we end up seeing. Uh, this is a infrared image of the retinal fundus. We see the optic disc. We can um, discriminate some of the blood vessels here and even some axonal fibers. Um, and when we turn on our GFP laser, we could see our retinal ganglion cells um, that express GFP in vivo. So this is a very nice technique to longitudinally track survival of individual mice over time. So from my initial um, shRNA injection experiments, these are representative images of my in vivo um, um, images at baseline and at different time points. As we can see when I inject SSH scramble control, over time, we see some loss, some significant loss of renal ganglion cells. Uh, similarly, with injection of SH ZCCHC12, we also see significant loss of renal ganglion cells. However, when I knock down SRTF1, uh, I can see that there is some sustained um, cell survival. This is the quantification of these images. Uh, we can see significant, there is significant cell survival um, compared to in the SHRNA SRTF, SRTF1 compared to the SH scramble controls. Also recently, um, since I did these injections and optic nerve crush, we thought it'd be a good idea for Dr. Park to do some as well to validate my crush. Um, and also we have another counter besides myself uh, who counted these, um, our scientist Paula in the lab um, and recent, I've just evaluated this this week and we saw that we see similar similar quantification. So there's a similar pattern. So it's nice to see that with two different surgeons and different counters, we, we still get the same result. These are stained retinal hole mounts of tissues injected with these different shRNAs. And we could see, again, just qualitatively a higher retinal ganglion cell density um, or higher GFP uh, positive retinal ganglion cells in the SH SRTF1 injected mouse. So to make sure that the cells that were labeled were actually retinal ganglion cells, um, I also co-labeled with RBPMS, which is a renal ganglion cell marker. And I could see here there's full co-localization. So this way I know that all of the GFP positive cells that I see in those in vivo images are in fact renal ganglion cells. I also took a look at the global population of RGCs. I wanted to see how um, the knockdown of this, this gene affected the overall survival of all renal ganglion cells uh, transfected or not. Um, but I did notice that it does not alter the survival of, to of the total population of RGCs. And we have some ideas in mind, but um, I think one of the main conclusions is that probably since I'm only transducing about maybe 20, 25 um, RGCs of the total the total RGC population. This is because one, I dilute my virus, and um, from there I calculated about a transduction efficiency about twenty twenty five percent. So that's probably just not enough to to affect the total uh, retinal ganglion cell population. Also, I just wanted to mention that there are many in vitro screens and in vivo screens that our lab performed to find genes that control retinal ganglion cell survival, leading to um, SRTF1. These screens include shRNAs and, and CRISPR-mediated knockdown of many signaling, mo signaling molecules and transcription factors. Among these are SDC1, CAR-HSP1, LMO1, uh, MEF2B and uh, RPH3A. Many of these knockdowns were examined using AAV2 viruses via intravitreal injection, and um, we did not see, however, any obvious survival 
uh, when knocking down these genes. Um, and actually, before uh, I started my studies on um, SRTF1 and ZCCHC12, I first used AAV retro shRNA to knock down uh, this syndicin 1, um, on, which is an integral membrane proteoglycan. Um, the reason syndicin 1 was tested was because our former postdoc in the lab had initially injected AAV shRNA for this gene in the vitreous, in the vitreous of the eye and saw signs of retinoganglion cell protection. So I tested the knockdown of just this gene using AAV retro, but found no significant difference in uh, retinoganglion cell survival compared to um, SH crumble controls. So here I'd like to go over some uh, ongoing and future experiments. So there's somewhat of a limitation to the AAV SHRNA GFP virus that we use in that when it gets transcribed in the cytosol, it remains there and it, it also kind of leaks out. So it labels the whole RGC soma and also enterogradely labels these, these axons. I'm not sure if you can appreciate it very well. Um, so the signal seems a bit diffuse. So we tried, why don't we try to compact the signal a bit? Um, so our scientists in the lab created um, or included a H2B um, sequence gene, sorry, inserted a sequence gene to target H2B along with um, a Green Lantern reporter. So what happens when this gets transcribed in the cytosol, we get a fusion protein and um, an H2B-MGL fusion protein. And since H2B has a high affinity for nucleosomes, it, it uh, basically sequesters this into the nucleus. So we, I injected these as mice with this as well. And I found that uh, we get much nicer um, confined signals um, is not as diffuse. And also Green Lantern is brighter than GFP. So our signals are, are much brighter and there's more contrast. So um, counting should be a lot easier with this. So I will also try to use some um, automated uh, software like IMARIS. It should be much easier to, to count the cells um, with that software. Now, now that we have uh, this nice uh, contrast and well-labeled cells. Something uh, we want to do too is analyze the mechanism of SRTF1 in regulating retinal ganglion cell survival. It's nice, it'd be nice to know what interactions are taking place and what are the targets of this transcription factor. Uh, so for this, I will be isolating um, our, GA, our uh, fluorescently labeled cells, perform RNA sequencing uh, to generate a transcriptomic profile of, of genes and be able to characterize its method its mechanism. I'll, we'll also be doing fish assays to examine the expression levels of SRTF1 after injury, and would also like to determine the specificity of SRTF1 in the retina uh, with these assays. Since SRTF1, is mainly involved in spermatogenesis and is highly expressed in the testes. I wanted to see if I could see its expression in a young male C57 black six mouse testes. And in this cross section of testes, uh, I could see nice robust labeling of um, our SRTF1. And so this is basically a nice, nice positive control. Uh, I also did this uh, fish in a uh, sagittal section of the brain, and we see that there's virtually no expression of SRTF1 here. So these are just some nice some uh, experiments that um, I'll be doing soon. And thank you all for your time. Uh, I hope to get these experiments completed soon and come back with some some exciting data. I would like to thank my mentor, Dr. Kevin Park, uh, the Park Lab members, Constant, especially Constantine Levi, for all his help with uh, generating our um, viruses. Uh, our new members in the lab, Paola 
Katanuto and Kelsey, and of course, Noah, um, Jan and the Imaging Core Lab, my committee members, the neuroscience program, and uh, our collaborators. Thank you very much. Anybody have any questions I could answer? I do have a question, Mary. Oh, nice. Oh, somebody okay. on Zoom is. It's oh. okay. So I'll, I'll ask it later. Oh, okay. Oh, Dr. Brambilla. <laughs> I'm here in the metaverse, but if there's anyone else that has a question first, it's okay. I'll ask it later. Can you guys hear Dr. Brambilla? Uh, so in the images you showed, it looked like the transduction efficiency across the retina looked fairly uniform after the injection into the colliculus. Uh, how many injections do you make into the colliculus? I make two injections at three different depths. At three different depths? Yeah. So I can make sure and, and, and get a nice, exactly, uniform labeling. So with the constructs that you made, did you somehow investigate whether the expression in the different retinal ganglion cell subtypes was equally efficient? I'm oh, sorry, can you, repeat, can you repeat that? Did you see if the constructs that you were using to knock down different things worked to this, with the same efficiency in the different retinal ganglion cell subtypes, like alphas versus betas and stuff like that. Oh, okay. We have. I haven't. I have yet to look um, at uh, subtype specificity expression for these uh, the virus. Yeah. How did you do the quantification of the retinal ganglion cells? Uh, in vivo, yes. Uh, so I take quadrants of the. Um, Retina, so it's like a 55 degree field of view. I take quadrants of superior, inferior, nasal. I put it all together. I kind of make a like a panoramic image. So overlaying um, and getting a nice overall view of of the retina. Um, then I um, make boxes of regions of regions of interest boxes along the whole um, fundus, and I just do manual counting. How do you select where those boxes go? Oh, so I, I try not to be um, biased. So I only avoid areas that, you know, maybe the focus is off or something um, or the signal just deteriorated because uh, the angle. So there, there's some limitations with, with, like I said, with the SH, with the diffuse labeling with the SHRNA GFP. So when you get more in the periphery, I don't know if you could tell um, here, yeah, there's some loss of, say, sorry, here. Sometimes there's loss of, of signal here. Um, and it's more, it's mainly because of the machine and because of the diffuseness of the, of the, um, uh, of the virus. Uh, so for example, for, for an image like this, I would, I would make regions of interest pretty much everywhere, except maybe an area where is really diffuse like this or very difficult to pinpoint uh, RGCs. But I do central and periphery um, like. So you're trying to count all of them or? Yeah, pretty much. Sorry, that's a short version. I should have just said, I try to count all of them, sorry. Do you use, so you're repetitively imaging the same retina from the same animal over time. Yes. So you use the same grid? for each time or you I try to grids? Yeah, I try to. Are you blinded to the treatment? Yes. Thanks. Dr. Roberta? Yes, hi, Mary. Um, hi. Quick question. So you have, you get a nice rescue of the um, RGC death with this uh, knockdown that you did with that gene. I was wondering, is that sufficient to get any type of um, functional recovery, vision function recovery? Uh, is that something that you can measure if these mice have an improved vision due to the rescue of this population? 
Yes, we can absolutely measure this uh, using uh, pattern electron electro retinogram or optic kinetics, uh, which we haven't yet. Uh, but that's something that that we would definitely consider oh, that we will be doing along the line. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Wouldn't it be great if a graduate student or postdoc asked a question? And I'm actually in her lab. Right. Um, Ask away. Yeah, but I'm I'm a research associate. With, with, yes, Dr. Okay. Um, so I will help me out here. Uh, so mm, okay. I want to know why your preference on uh colors, I in, in terms of your stains, why go with green when I know that you can do like is there a difference between the labeling between green and red in terms that made you selectively favor green in terms of your stains back to your previous slides? If like if you go back to the cover slide. Yeah. That's because our, our reporter is GFP. So we need to stain with uh, uh antibody for GFP. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, this do this is it still thought that the um, retinal neurons after compression injury die by apoptotic cell death? So these cell somas do die by apoptotic, apoptotic cell death. Apoptotic cell death. Yes. So the genes you're picking on um, are they manipulating upstream or downstream molecular pathways involved in the apoptotic? Uh, cascade. That's something we'd like to figure out. Yeah. Oh, very good. That'd be good to do. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, now I actually have a, a row question. Have you tried testing for particular caspase in terms of your uh, like IL markers for uh, when you're, you're dealing with the apoptotic uh, cell death? Have you tried uh, like Staining for, for the markers. For markers for inflammation? Yeah. Cytokines. Yes. Um, no, but there there's there is um inflammatory um cascades that are occurring that should be occurring after injury to the optic nerve. Okay. But we yeah, we haven't stained for that. At least would you like to ask a question? Actually, yes, I want to improve on his question. Okay, well, I'm going to improve on my questions now. So uh, 10, 15 years ago, uh, pharmaceutical companies were doing tons of high-throughput screening with knockdown strategies, siRNAs or shRNAs. And they found that if they, they needed to use several different sequences to ensure that they were knocking down the gene of interest at least once, uh, and, and they also thought it was important to demonstrate specifically that they were knocking down a, a given target. You did some controls to try and show that your shRNAs were able to bind to the appropriate sequence in a reporter and show that it changed the expression of that, but that doesn't actually show that you're knocking down the target of interest in the, in the retinal ganglion cells. Could you tell us a little bit about what you've done to show that, that you can knock down that gene in retinal ganglion cells? Yeah, so that's where my uh, upcoming uh, fluorescence and high 2 hybridization um, assays will be doing. So I will be looking at uh, a control group. So uh, uh, retinal ganglion cell that was not, that does not have knockdown of the SRTF1 uh, compared to control and make sure that I could see or the absence of uh, the TAP seven L in 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 the, in the renal samples. I mean, there's not there's not really um, validated antibody for um, the SRTF one. I did I did, however, order one just to try it out to see how it, you know see if we can see expression of it in the protein level. Uh, but that's where I'm actually conducting those in the next couple of weeks. Uh, the fish. Uh, to make sure that we don't see detection of of TAF seven of 
the SHR, the sorry, survival regulating transcription factor one in the uh, in the retina. Great, thanks. So something else that's been found uh, more than once is, is that the sequences that are used to knock down a target can also knock down other things. Do you have any uh, evidence that the SHRNAs that you have are not disrupting the expression of other genes? Um, not, not this far, but um, I, I do have a, another SHRNA for that same gene that I will try to, um, th that I will also use to um, inject and see if there are any you know, off-target effects. Right. Thanks. Two more questions here. Uh, he's been itching for a long time. All right. I, I want to improve on the question. Um, yeah, I, so I, um, I think the question that Vance asked about the selectivity of the AV2 retro is really important because the AV2 retro doesn't label all neurons the same way. So you need to know which neurons are getting labeled more than others. So mm -hmm. I, I, I think that needs to be done uh, because you can assume that he's um, staining all the projecting neurons in an equal way. Yeah. Um, that is exactly. So the second question is, I said I'm going to improve. I'm <laughs> going to comment to improve on his question. But also but to that effect, not all RGCs, like there's some RGCs that don't project to the spirit I know that I we're know. missing as well. So. Uh, the the second is do I know it's early data. Do you see a difference in terms of the counts between cytoplasmic versus nuclear? I, I just got this. Yeah, I just imaged this a couple of days ago, so no, I haven't done the counts yet. Because there do seem to be differences on it. Yeah. Can you tell us more about this? Us, us, SRTF1 seems to do something with stereogenic control since it's on the testes and maybe male hormones. How does this, you know, any ideas how this transcription factor might work that so has to do with? All, all I know about it is that it um, regulates um, a, a complex uh, that's involved in adipocyte formation and spermatogenesis. There's, yeah, not 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 too much um, known outside of that um, in, in studies um, for like in the CNS or anything like that. And the retina female identified. males the same. That is something we're actually going to look at soon because I did inject some males. So so far, all of the the retinas I injected were females, and I actually recently did some males as well. So I'll be looking. I can look to see if there are any differences in males or females. Yeah. Hey Mary, great job. I'm sure it was hard to find a factor that actually works. Um, so so good job. Uh, you you had mentioned in the beginning that. You know, Eric showed that if these um, vulnerable cells are RGCs are still not dying, that their axons still don't regenerate. Right? Did I recall that recall that correctly? Yes. So, so getting back to Roberta's question about functional recovery, even if you get these vulnerable cells to survive, do you expect that their connection would also survive, and that? which would be, I guess, required for you to have functional recovery? Yeah, that's that's um, that's um, difficult, right? Because we don't even know what, what exactly what cells are acting upon. Because um, maybe they're, they're not even uh, uh, ex expressed in, in on-off direction selective renal ganglion cells, or maybe they are. So I think it, it probably depend more on that, but I, let's say that they are. Um, and I, I feel like there probably wouldn't be maybe much functional recovery if the majority of the cells of the um, genes that we're knocking down are in these on-off direction selective um, renal ganglion cell types. We, I, I think, in my opinion, I think maybe we wouldn't see much recovery. Um, so have you, have you checked know. the optic nerve in, in the animals that you were tracing with GFP? Because presumably it labeled the axons too, right? Yes. Yes, in in this in these because of the anterograde 
um, labeling, at least in these. Yeah, but I, I haven't looked at the optic nerves yet. I do have them embedded and I will be sectioning them to see how that looks. Yeah. And then the, the second question is uh, I'm, I'm, for, I guess, therapeutic purposes, it would be more advantageous to do the intravitreal injections, right? Rather than superior colliculus injections, right? <laughs> in, in people, right, in people. There so so despite, the, despite the compounds that you had mentioned, um, is that kind of in your future plans to do the intravitreous and, and, and kind of verify that it works either way? Well, we haven't talked about that yet, but I don't see why, yeah, that I mean, that, that would be a, definitely a good, good way to, to see how. The other thing is with the intravitreal injection, we're also not um, only transducing retinal ganglion cells, other other cells. Sure, but this, 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 despite well, all but, that, you know, despite all that, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we can try that. Yeah, okay. thank you. Do we have any other questions? Some listeners, do we have any other questions? I have one. So if you look, uh, this is supposed to be a, this is a nice model that hopefully mimics some of the uh, molecular mechanisms of axonal regeneration, cell survival, that's consistent with between the uh, optic nerve and the spinal cord and getting to the spinal cord. And now we know there's three really distinct uh, ages in terms of when people have spinal cord injuries. That's very young, which you may be mimicking here, intermediate, 45 years, 50 year. And then the older group is a, that it's emerging large peak there on the older individuals. So when you, when studies like this that are looking at uh, various genes that may be associated with uh, cell survival, are people looking at age uh, as a uh, independent variable in terms of genetic responses to injury, specifically in the, in the retina, I think. Yeah. I I don't think I've read much with age, but definitely they're looking at different models of um, a chronic injury or acute injury, um, and and sometimes there there are different responses uh, of subtypes. Uh, they differ in their response in a chronic versus um, an acute injury. So I do know that they they are looking at different models uh, as far as that, but age I I haven't um, yeah. Really, um, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, more questions. Thank you, everybody, and have a nice holiday.